Good morning, and thank you very much for the invitation to be part of this uh, great seminar. I'm very happy to, to talk about my experience. Um, I was provided a few uh, questions from uh, from the people who organized the seminar, and according to this question, I, I um, structured my um, testimonial. So the first question I received was, was it your first ERC proposal submission? And yes, indeed, I applied for the first time. And uh, for me, it was the right timing as it was just after I received this permanent position to start my research group. And it gave me actually the possibility to really think about what I want to do with my group, where do I want to go. And I, I also had the time and the freedom to decide it for myself, to take the time to think about what I want to do and the time to prepare this proposal. Um, I started to prepare at the beginning of September. And while I retrospectively think that my timing was quite tight, it was limited due to the fact that I had a two month parental leave just before I started the preparation. And the first thing I um, did was to reach out to my, the ULB Europe office or department, specifically Rachel Lepreau at my university, who was very, very helpful just to, you know, talk about my idea, the general organization um, of the proposal or how to apply the type of support and help that is available at my university. And that was generally very helpful to get all this information and get me into the thinking how to organize this whole, uh, how to do the proposal. And during this initial meeting, I also discussed, uh, as I mentioned, my idea. And it turned out um, that it was maybe not a good idea to go for this idea because it was not a standalone idea, meaning that I had uh, used not part, it was related yet different in another proposal, the one that got me the position. So it was discussed that there is maybe a risk um, that it may be too overlapping and I should uh, think about something else. So this is what I did. Um, I started to look for a new idea at the beginning and this idea was born out of my previous work and finding. And so, yes, it is a continuation of my previous work, but at a whole new level. And um, when I started to prepare my, my application and thought about the idea, I what I remember is that I saw this whole process more as an ERC starting grant application. It was really about... I'll develop something, I will work on the next years and I will do it anyway. It's a good moment to do it now for the ERC and use it. But if it doesn't work out, I will I will make it work with other funding. So that helped me also or motivated me because there were times I may have been a bit, bit dis, disencouraged by the so, so success rates. But I also had the attitude, there's nothing to lose. You can only win doing that. And that really helped me to, to get through this thing. Um, the next question I was asked, how did you organize your work for preparing this, propo pre this proposal? And um, did you have uh, use any crucial preparatory activities? So I started based on the fact that I had to find a new idea uh, that was standalone. I started with a lot of reading to really get a, a, an idea of the, a full overview of the state of the art of my field and see uh, whether my idea is state of the art and really beyond state of the art. That's really important. That took me about two weeks. Um, once I developed the idea, I teased the idea at a seminar in our lab. And to be honest, I did not always get good feedback. One of the comments was it's too risky, but I followed my instinct anyway with that idea. And when I then started to develop the whole proposal, like really thinking about the structure, the work packages, I had a continuous discussion with a trusted colleague um, to, you know, discuss my idea, the structure, the work packages, how I want to um, build a proposal for about two weeks till I had a clear plan um, that I wanted to follow, a clear structure. And I already started writing during these times. And important is that I also reached out to successful grantees to ask whether can I can see their proposals. So I studied them to have an idea, first of all, how did they structure it? How did they sell it? To really learn 
what's the difference between B1 and B2? I found it very difficult at the beginning to understand how to write it differently, what to focus on in both of them. And going through these other proposals that really helped me to understand that, but also to come up with my own format because I, I saw what I liked, what I disliked. And then obviously I, I, I based on what I liked, I uh, came up with my own format, how I want to write this proposal. The writing of the proposal took about three weeks full time, and it was a very intense time because there was not a lot of time left for me. And while writing the proposal, I also um, hit, um, how would I say, I hit moments where I needed more knowledge or wasn't unclear in certain points, because the deeper you go in detail, you know, it also raises question you haven't thought at the beginning about. So I reached out to experts for the specific questions from clinicians to, to other people that had the expertise in technologies to really discuss specific parts of the um, proposal to help me. Um, and I also identified potential collaborators and asked for the agreement. So that was in place. And importantly, I chose my collaborators to complement my knowledge, really where I thought um, that I don't bring the experience I need or it's not enough. This is where I put the collaborators to then say in my proposal, you know, I know I'm new to this, but I have help from these people who are experts in that field. Um, what I mentioned with this B1, B2, which was a bit unclear for me at the beginning, maybe I took a quite unusual way writing it. I, I first prepared an in-between document that's basically longer than the B1, but shorter than the B2. But then when I had this in-between document that had the entire structure, everything I needed, I then shortened this in-between document to make my B1 and not just shorten it. I also wrote it in a in a way that I focused much more um, on the novelty um, to bring that out and what is beyond the state of the art. But it also had, of course, a short background, the hypothesis, and uh, explained the research plan I have and had even a short part on outcome risk and mitigation. And then from this in-between uh, document with the remaining time I had, I built that up, extended it to make the B2 uh, which has much more scientific uh, details on each section, like the background, the aims, the methodology, risk mitigation. I had more figures with details, workflows for the aims, some, prelim some preliminary data, and also part about project structure, management, collaboration, and talk much more about my experience, how this is helpful uh, to mitigate the risk. Um, and importantly, through this writing, I had, of course, a lot of help from uh, our ULB Europe office, Rachel Lepreau, who, who did a wonderful uh, job at helping me, especially with the other important parts like the budget, the edicts, the resources, um, getting this letter from directrice for support and also helping me with the abstracts. And um, overall, I found writing the proposal, given that I had a very limited time, intense and stressful and retrospectively, and I will come to the end to that, I would have done a few things different. I, I wanna give you as an advice. Um, another question I, I had uh, was to which panel did you apply? How did you choose it? Um, so with respect to how to choose a panel, I had a discussion again with the ULB Europe office about how to best, best, best choose the panel and uh, this uh, discussion reflected what was said in this uh, info session here. So it's really based on your proposal where it fits best. So I started to research all the panels, their description, their focus, and with the two, three uh, remaining panels that were of interest for my proposal, I really checked um, what projects they funded in the recent years. And I also looked up potential panel members and got to, uh, and tried to understand what their research focus is. And based on, on this um, information I got from this research, I, I decided for the panel I would apply. For in my case, it was LS7 because my project is very translational, uh, has a very translational clinical nature. And it really fitted well the project that panel um, funded in the past. And um, 
while I still defend this panel choice, I have to let you know that my proposal was switched um, to LS9. Um, the next question I received for my testimonial was, how did you manage to balance the groundbreaking nature of the proposed research versus its feasibility? Um, so the groundbreaking nature of my um, proposal was that that I proposed something that was completely new for my field that was never done before. But um, so basically to develop a new technology to study an existing question, but at a completely new level. And I balanced the risk of my proposal by pointing out that I have experience, not with precisely this technology I wanted to develop, but with technologies that lead to this new technology or that this new technology is partly based on. But I also showed, showed uh, or brought uh, evidence and references that uh, this new technology has been used in other fields and could be adapted to be used in my field. And of course, I brought in the collaborators with this complementary knowledge. Uh, I also named and listed the risks uh, in my proposal in both B1, but much more extensive in B2 to say, you know, to show I thought about it and I provided a mitigation plan. Um, the last question I had was if I have any other recommendations for future candidates. And again, this is based on my um, experience with my proposal. I would say do not wait until your last attempt again to say, uh, what what was said in this um, info session already. For me, it was the first time, but also my last chance to get it, that created retrospectively, I would say, a lot of pressure, uh, especially when I was at the interview stage, uh, knowing you made it that far, but it's your last chance. It was a lot of pressure to get it because I, I could not have reapplied to the starting grant itself. So don't wait so long. Try to do it earlier and make the time for it start to prepare a bit earlier than me to have not such an intense time writing it. It is possible, obviously, but it was really a, a very intense time. And I wish retrospectively I had had more time to think and show it other people and discuss it a bit more. Um, follow your instinct and opinion, because also when you consult with people, discuss with people, you will get a lot of feedback. Obviously, it's not always the same. In the end, it's you who has to decide and stand up for your proposal. And you know, you have most of the information. You read your, you know what the state of the art of your field is. So while obviously take into account what you what you listen, what you, what you uh, learn from others, in the end, you're the one making the decision what you follow up on. Um, a very nice advice I got from somebody, but it didn't work for me, but I would like to pay forward is um, to make a short one page outline of your idea with the hypothesis and a short research plan and send it around before you get writing to really get a feedback about the idea itself and the strategy or your of your proposal before you really go into the intense uh, phase of the writing. So you avoid to changing plans or, you know, um, even the whole strategy of the proposal while you're in the writing. Uh, I would say also plan to work full time on the proposal for the last two to three weeks before the deadline. Have a support system, people that cheer you on and motivate you. Because as I said, for me, it got intense and there were definitely phases where I lost a bit of motivation because I felt it got a bit too much. So it was really important to have these people around me that motivated me and, and cheered me on. Um, do not underestimate parts like the budget, ethics, and resources that takes time. Don't leave it till, you know, the last few days before the deadline. And uh, what I tried helped me. I had good and bad writing days, bad writing days where sometimes I just couldn't put on paper in a nice way that was in my head. And on those days, I tried to do things like budget, ethics, and resources um, to have that done or my CV and things like that. So that's it from my side. I hope it's helpful and yeah, I'm happy to answer additional questions. Well, many thanks for your uh, presentation, Jana. Uh, we have indeed uh, received a question from the audience. Uh, how can one see who is in a panel? 
are the panel members not anonymous? Also, can one see which projects were funded by the various panels? Testimony, the testimony said she could see this when she wrote her proposal. Yeah, so the panel members of the past panels, uh, of the past calls are public, or at least uh, they can be provided. And uh, that was, uh, for, to me, provided by, um, by the UB Europe office. And you can, there is certain rules that so and so many percentage, I think 60% of the panel members from two years ago come back. So you can kind of estimate, guesstimate, which uh, that a certain amount of these members may be on the new panel. So based on that, I looked it up. And there is also lists of funded projects you can look up. Okay, thank you. And then there's uh, another question on the interview. After getting the invitation to the interview under all this pressure, how exactly did you prepare for the Q&A during the interview? And how did you prepare for giving crystal clear answers? I failed in an interview before and I found it a very, very confusing experience, amongst others because the questions were coming from all over the room and from on online panel members. And I was not able to see or hear who was talking. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I, I think it was the same for me. It was uh, not, not easy to, I find it difficult to prepare for it because what I was told is you have to answer in a very quick and crisp way, be straight to the point. And uh, I was unable to do that at the beginning, but I was trained uh, again by the ULB uh, Europe office that did a great job through uh, organizing mock interviews. And in those mock interviews, you are being asked question and you try to answer them. And in the beginning of these mock interviews, I you build your answer the way you think. So meaning you build up and the thing I should have said straight only came at the end of the answer. So I found it very frustrating that people then would say, yeah, but what you said now after so and so many sentences, that's what you said, said first, but it's not how my brain somehow worked. So it was really a training of um, learning, thinking beforehand. I mean, writing down all potential questions you get during the interview, give your proposal to other people, ask what type of question they would ask when they read it, try to think yourself of questions they will ask. So I wrote all these questions down and I thought beforehand of the potential answers, wrote them down or just a few keywords, how I would start to answer to be to the point and I trained that. And by doing this, going through this process, I somehow learned to be more to the point and I could, even if the question I received was not exactly what I had in my question catalog, I could recycle questions from or answers from this catalog to answer some of these new questions. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, and then, then we go on with the last question. Um, I come from a small research institute. How important was the support from the uh, support office? For me, it was very important, I think. Uh, as I said, it, it helped from, I mean, at, at many levels, the whole... Um, organization of the proposal, also the platform, they explained it to me, they helped me, um, there were reminders, they were on top of things asking, have you written this, uh, you know, for the budget to think about certain things and um, not so much for the scientific part, because that's really up to you to write, obviously, because you're the expert, but for everything around there, we're there. Um, and especially once I made it to the interview stage, I, I find them very supportive and helpful. There are um, consulting services one can, um, or people use to prepare also for interviews. So in case the institution doesn't have the support, maybe that is an alternative. They're really specialized in preparing you for the ERC grant. Okay, 